Hello everyone, this is Richard with the Modern Healthspan newsletter. First, a disclaimer. In this newsletter series, we will share the latest research studies, news and events in the Healthspan field that we found interesting. It is not a recommendation or medical advice. First, we would like to give a shout out to our supporters who are very generous to buy us some coffees. It encourages us to continue to share information on ageing research. Thank you so much for your support. Let's look at this paper from November 2019 entitled Topical Rapamycin Reduces Markers of Senescence and Aging in Human Skin, an Exploratory Prospective Randomized Trial. Note that topical refers to something that is applied to a surface, so in this case a cream applied to skin. We won't go into the details of the paper today, we will just dump into the results. The first is that topical rapamycin reduced the expression of the P16 protein, which is consistent with the reduction in cellular senescence. This change was accompanied by relative improvement in clinical appearance of the skin and histological markers of aging, and by an increase in collagen 7, which is critical to the integrity of the basement membrane. It seems that there are now a couple of rapamycin topical creams on the market. This is one of them. It contains 0.2% sirolimus, where sirolimus is a trade name for rapamycin, although it does require a prescription. It is interesting to see rapamycin not just as an anti-aging drug taken orally, but potentially for anti-skin aging as well. For our first paper today, we will look at this one, which looks at NMNH as an NAD booster. The study includes in vitro and in vivo mouse model experiments. As they say, NAD is of key importance in many reactions in our cells and can be compromised due to degradation of NAD-dependent enzymes. NR and NMN are used to boost the NAD levels, but the effects on intracellular NAD are not clear. In this study, the authors synthesized NMNH, the reduced form of NMN, in the lab. They showed that NMNH increases NAD plus levels to a much higher extent than NR or NMN, and it is converted to NAD through a different pathway, not using NRK or NAMPT, the enzymes that convert NR and nicotinamide respectively to NMN. They looked specifically at the effects on the kidney. They also tested on mice in vivo to see how it was absorbed and whether it would increase NAT levels in the specific tissues. Let's have a look at some of the specific results that they saw in the tests. First, some in vitro tests. Here we see the amount of NAD seen inside mouse liver cells after they are in a solution of NMN and NMNH of various concentrations. NMNH seemed to reach a limit at about 500 micromoles. And then the amount of NAD remaining after a time period when they were in a solution of 500 micromoles. In both cases, we can see a much larger concentration of NAD inside the cells for NMNH rather than NMN. Here are the results across different cell types. The first is the mouse liver cells mentioned before. For others, T37I cells are mouse brown fat cells, and SY5Y is a human bone marrow cell, for example. Again, we can see that NAD content was higher with NMNH. And here are the results from the in vivo test that they did. They used an injection and recorded blood NAD levels where we can see much higher levels with NMNH over time. A second injection was administered after 20 hours. After the experiment, they looked at the levels of NAD in various tissues where we can see that it was also higher for NMNH. As they mentioned at the start, the authors had to make their own NMNH as it is not commercially available at this time and the in vivo administration was via injection. This bypasses the digestive system and since people would want to take it orally, how it gets absorbed through the gut would be a question that needs to be answered. A very interesting experiment, an NMNH certainly looks like a promising compound. It seems to be absorbed better than existing NAD boosters, which would show that it would work with lower doses. Our second paper is a meta-analysis that looks at omega-3 fats and how they can help with muscle mass, strength and performance in older people. Sarcopenia, the loss of muscle function, is common in elderly and leads to a number of medical complications. The current recommendations involve physical exercise and nutritional supplementation, particularly maintaining protein intake of about 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. 
The concern is that high protein diet may increase insulin resistance and diabetes and so may not be the best option for all people. As well as protein, several studies have reported on associations of muscle mass and performance with fish-derived N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids or N3 PUFAs such as EPA and DHA. As sarcopenia is associated with inflammation and PUFAs are anti-inflammatory, they may help with this condition. The studies have looked at three of the compounds, EPA, DHA and ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, not to be confused with alpha-lipoic acid. Previous evidence shows that N3 PUFAs intake supported musculoskeletal health, with some of them showing that supplementation with PUFAs enhanced the rate of muscle protein synthesis in the elderly. Some trials have shown significant improvement, whereas others have not. As they say, the musculoskeletal health benefits are inconclusive, so they performed a systematic meta-analysis of the effects of N3 PUFAs on key skeletal muscle outcomes in adults over 60, with specific outcomes being muscle mass, strength and performance. It has mostly been protein supplementation which has been investigated for sarcopenia, and the studies which discussed PUFAs did not present the outcomes with strong evidence or conclusions. The findings based on 10 randomized controlled trials and 552 participants was that there was an increase in muscle mass by about 0.33 kilograms, especially with more than 2 grams per day of N3 PUFA. However, it did not seem to increase grip strength or 1 rep max for leg strength but it did seem to improve the timed up-and-go test compared to that of controls with a faster walking speed, where the up-and-go test measures the time taken to stand up from a chair, walk 3 meters, turn around, walk back and sit back in the chair. In the report, the authors mentioned that 2 grams per day was required. I would note that this is quite a large dose of omega-3 to supplement with. We currently take krill oil supplement, but the amount is less than 2 grams we may start taking another capsule to get to the 2 gram mark. The other thing is that they mentioned that the muscle mass was increased by 0.33 kilograms. So for me at 43% muscle and 63 kilograms according to my scales, this would represent a 1.2% increase. An interesting point of this is that retaining or increasing muscle mass is dependent on the muscle synthesis being more than the muscle degradation. And it may not be enough to have just the protein blocks around, the synthesis may also depend on having the correct fats, so I will continue to take my krill oil. Now for our event corner. On March 23rd, 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, there is a symposium hosted by Aging Science Talks entitled Frailty, Quantifying Heterogeneity in Aging, Discussing Aging in Mice, Chimpanzees and Humans. You can see their pinned tweet on how to join. The link is in the description. The next event, hosted by Euroimmun Academy, is on March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The topic is Biofluid Biomarkers for Alzheimer's Disease, Amyloid Tau and Beyond. The registration link again is in the description. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the Modern Healthspan newsletter informative. As we find more interesting research and longevity news, we will release our next newsletter. Please stay tuned. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.